Welcome to day one of the inaugural California Digital Humanities Research Institute, or Cali DHRI. I am Tatiana Bryant, co-director of Cali DHRI and research librarian for Digital Humanities, History, and African American Studies at UC Irvine. I'd like to start today with a land and labor acknowledgement. Higher education institutions, settlers, and guests exist on the traditional occupied or unceded territories of hundreds of tribes across what is currently known as the state of California. This land has been stewarded by indigenous people since time immemorial, in spite of forced removal and assimilation policies, as well as oppressive systems and structures that continue to perpetuate their erasure. We also want to acknowledge the long history of colonization, slavery, forced migrations, coerced labor, exclusion, and racism experienced by indigenous and black communities across California and the US. We invite you to learn more about this history and consider how you can materially support disenfranchised communities. I want to also make sure we thank our sponsors. Kelly DHRI is a new annual digital ethics studies institute inspired by the CUNY Digital Humanities Research Institute and hosted by UC Irvine Libraries and UCLA Libraries. We're also sponsored by UCLA's Digital Humanities Program, the Center for the Study of Women, Streisand Center, and Office of Advanced Research Computing, as well as the USC Mellon Humanities and the Digital World Program. Kelly DHRI co-director and UCLA librarian for digital research and scholarship, Zoe Borofsky and I also wanna thank our team of instructors, Yo Kawano, who is the lead computation scientist for GIS and spatial data science for the Office of Advanced Research Computing at UCLA. Eleanor Cole is the senior program manager for research facilitation in the Office of Advanced Research Computing at UCLA. Andy Rukowski is the visualization librarian at USC Libraries. Joy Gui, Gui excuse me, is the Emerging Technologies Advocate at the Social Sciences Center for Education Research and Technology at UCLA. Nick Schweiderman is a PhD student in Information Studies at UCLA. Winnie Kurtz is a lecturer and project scientist with the program in Digital Humanities at UCLA. Sam Carter is a PhD candidate in Visual Studies at UC Irvine. Stacey Williams is the librarian for the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies at UCLA. Stacey Shin is, the, is a PhD candidate in English at UCLA. Jesslyn Wattel is a PhD candidate in English at UCLA. And Pradeep Kanan is a PhD student in musicology at UCLA. And without all of um, these wonderful people, we would not be able to host Cali DHRI um, this year or, or any year. Um, so this year, Cali DHRI centers Black digital humanities. Our 2022 theme, the Black Press, will be explored by three keynote speakers over three days who will each highlight their own Black DH research and projects. Feel free to add any questions and comments for our opening keynote speaker, Dr. Ellen Scott, to the Q&A at any point. Today's keynote speaker, Dr. Ellen Scott, is Associate Professor and Associate Dean at UCLA's School of Theater, Film, and Television. She's the author of the 2015 Rutgers University Press book, Cinema Civil Rights, Race Repression, and Race in the Classical Hollywood Era, and is working on two new books, Cinema's Pe Peculiar Institution, which is a history of the representation of slavery on screen, and Bitter Ironies, Tender Hopes, which explores Black women's film criticism from the dawn of cinema until the first Black woman made a feature film in 1980. Her talk today is titled Finding Elizabeth Mitchell, Tracing the History of Early Black Atlantic Filmmaking. Dr. Scott, feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Tatiana, and thank you also to the entire team for having me here. It's really great to be here today. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. Let me find... Um, how to do that. Okay. <clears throat> Just a second. I think I'm starting not at the beginning, which is a little dangerous, but here we are. Okay. Um, so thanks so much um, for having me here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today <clears throat> about um, 
the research I've been doing, um, which which is sort of in the digital humanities realm, and um, and certainly um, has taken me to new depths in terms of digital humanities scholarship and research. Um, so I'll start just by talking a little bit about um, one um, interesting discovery I made um, through doing this research. And then I'll go on to talk a little bit about the methods, the methodology in the later parts of the talk. So, um, <clears throat> so in earlier generations, we could find the names of early black filmmakers in scattered newspaper accounts. Uh, the tremendous initial work done by uh, American film historians and scholars like Jacqueline Bobo, Yvonne Welbon, and Pearl Bowser uh, provide a key groundwork for this research. Uh, but the portal opened by current digital methods provides new through ways for discovering Black film history and for uncovering the Black past deeply and systematically buried by white supremacist archival practices. In this presentation, I'll discuss both the discoveries I made about Elizabeth Mitchell, an early Black woman filmmaker and international documentarist, and also methods and approaches that Zoe Borowski and I employ to develop this research. The methods um, suggest ways to develop answers to existing historical absences, those quote unquote bundles of silences that dominant mainstream historiography leaves repressed, as Michelle Rolf Trio articulates. This process of retrieval, even with mass media like newspapers, allows us both a method for rethinking Black women's media histories, but also for addressing historiographic conundra brought about by the pattern systematic silencing of so-called resistant, so-called aberrant, and certainly underrepresented pasts. So I want to begin by um, just a little, giving a little bit of a, a timeline here of Black women filmmakers. So we have a, a sense of, of where uh, Elizabeth Mitchell kind of fits in this historiography. Um, so in 1902, we had Drusilla Dungy Houston, who wrote a response to Dixon's The Leopard Spots as a flashing photo play, according to the Women Pioneers website that Jane Gain offers. Um, Bessie Viola Johnson in 1916 writes a response to the birth of a nation as a screenplay and poem. Um, Jenny Vanderzee in 1918 makes a newsreel of Black World War I soldiers doing their bit with her husband, husband E. Toussaint Welcome. I'm sorry, I have some animations here. <clears throat> um, and up to this point, you know, the next sort of spot on the line is Tressie Souders, um, who writes, uh, directs and produces A Woman's Error, and then Maria P. Williams, who founds Western Producing Company and makes Flames of Wrath in 1923, and then on to Ethel Ely, who forms the Ely Film Company, um, and then Zora Neale Hurston and Aslanda Good Robeson. And so I'm, I'm putting Elizabeth Mitchell on this timeline for the first time because she hasn't been discussed before. So I think it's important to state, and you can see from this timeline, that Black women were producers, screenwriters, and filmmakers in the 19 teens and 20s. For Black women in this moment, the ambition was major and transcendent, but the idiom was travelogue often, educational film, newsreel, or amateur uh, in many instances. These mediums seemed in some ways more promising to them, and I'm thinking particularly about newsreels and educational films, um, in terms of their last value and impact than the then short-lived entertainment films of the era. Um, and so, and still, I think it's really important to note that Black women in this time were seeing themselves as producers of films. So I'll talk to you now about Elizabeth Mitchell. Um, so I found her. I was not looking for her when signs emerged, poking up like an inconspicuous blip across the sands of microfilmed images. She is the foremother of Madeline Anderson, Camille Billups, Jacqueline Shearer, John Comfra, and Shala Lynch. She was there all along, was evidence of Black femme cinematic time travel before compensation or cycles, waving like a newsies paper across the tides of time. So now I want to place her image in the magic lantern for you so that we can find her together. Since she has no archive, no direct descendants, we have had to reconstruct the facts of her life scattered about. 
The spaces and circles she occupied in documents and images provide us a window into the world she tra traversed and the world she made on screen. The below was crafted from the only record we have in 2022, though my hope is that the future will bring greater and greater access to the past, her past and ours. To begin with, the reels are lost and the records are sparse. But the result of these, this absence, this loss, has been the expansion of the frame, an exploration of the constellation of documents arranged according to a historiographic question, which documents together reveal glimpses of the films that she made and what they meant. In Venus in Two Acts, Sadia Hartman details the process of critical fabulation, a mode of engaging with Black women's early uh, I'm sorry, Black women's histories, and particularly the histories of Black enslaved women, uh, violently obliterated by the archive. Hartman is clear, however, that critical fabulation is not about telling the story we wish had happened, a practice she calls romance, but rather about disordering the archive and developing a, quote, recombinant narrative of history, one that loops the strands of incommensurate accounts and which weaves present, past, and future in retelling the story and in narrating the time of slavery as our present, unquote. Indeed, critical fabulation is a challenge to narrative history and the notion of temporality built into historical ontology itself. In Wayward Lives, her book, Hartman suggests how critical fabulation provides a blueprint for feminist, Black feminist archival practice. <clears throat> so scholars Thaddeus Davis, Erica Armstrong Dunbar, and Tamara Walker have practiced this historiography using existing often granular evidence to flesh out Black women's praxis and pasts. These historians and Hartman are a key part of my lantern's apparatus this morning. So let me talk to you a little bit about Elizabeth Mitchell. So the timeline begins in 1920, just over 100 years ago, though it stretches back farther and forward to our children's futures. On July 19, 1920, a rainy day with thunder showers, Elizabeth Mitchell, uh, Murray Mitchell, age 36, formerly head of music and musical programs at the West Virginia Collegiate Institute, and Ola Eleanor Calhoun, age 24, her student, set sail from New York Harbor on the steamship Patria, the first cruise ship equipped with a cinema, on a 16-day passage from Marseille and then Africa, specifically Algiers and Tunis, to make a movie. Two Black women unaccompanied on a three months long voyage. Small step steps onto a three cylindered ship and one great leap into the journey that would become a beginning for film history and film time. <clears throat> In the wake of World War I's Black militancy and the Red Summer of 1919, and in the midst of a disappointing women's suffrage campaign that ended in the simultaneously practical and venomous exclusion of Black women, Mitchell, largely unaffiliated and undeterred by national and international chaos, set off on her fourth worldwide journey, this one explicitly to redress images of people of African descent by casting a different light on Africa in her travelogues. Quote, for a number of years, I've made a study of moving pictures, in the various pictures, I seldom saw anything showing the better side of the life of our people. Even in the picture of World War I's Pershing Crusaders, the pictures of our soldiers at their very best were not shown. On the other hand, it seemed as though only the ridiculous side of the race was desired to be shown. I determined from there to devote my life to the educational travelogue, showing to the people of America that we have a better side, Mitchell said in a widely syndicated article. As one of the most traveled Black women of her time, Mitchell was in good position to challenge anti-Black stereotypes. What began as an African filmmaking journey evolved into a bold transnational documentary project and planned exchange. The plan was this, Mitchell would shoot footage of Black Europe um, and North Africa and bring these images back to the United States to exhibit. And then while touring the US with these films, she would shoot more documentary images of Black Americans that she would then take back to Africa and exhibit there while making still more films in Africa to bring back to America. In a project with the striking conceptual resonance with Ava DuVernay's Array Distribution Network, um, Mitchell's plan would have made her one of the earliest known international Black film distributors, in addition to being the earliest Black woman documentary cinematographer and likely the first Black American diasporic filmmaker. 
Her films may well have been the first international documentary images shot by an African-American for a broad public distribution. Though somewhat lightly described as travelogue films, Mitchell's planned project was novel in many senses, not only because of the ways that it reconceptualized the Black world and the place and space of what she called the darker races, but because of how in ways particular to cinema's post-transitional era and to amateur filmmaking, her project collapsed film production, distribution, and exhibition into a single episode, in these ways shifting the logics of Black female and cinematic time in one venture. While it is documented that Mitchell herself shot films, quote, holding her own camera, unquote, in Africa, Europe, and Harlem, and exhibited them throughout the US with a focus on the East and Midwest, it is unlikely that Mitchell ever shot the second set of American films she intended or made the second trip to Africa to exhibit them. However, what she ended up doing was epic enough. Upon returning to the US, Mitchell not only developed her own 4,000 feet of film shot in North Africa, England, France, and Italy, and paired them in exhibition phase with lectures of her own elaborate design, but evidence indicates that she contacted the US Signal Corps and they furnished 2,000 feet of films of black soldiers in France from World War I. She combined the government releases with the other scenes of Black American life, or Black life in America, presenting, quote, our side of the story. Mitchell's scenes of American life included films that she had made likely in 1919 and early 1920 of, quote, progressive activities, unquote, in Harlem, and footage of a football game at the West Virginia Collegiate Institute, where she worked before. We can only sketch the happenings in Mitchell's life in the beginning of 1920. Articles record that she perfected herself in the art of making uh, moving pictures films in New York um, in the winter preceding her summer filmmaking trip, but no sources specify where she trained. Whatever training Mitchell received, she confidently took charge of the film's production at the front and back end. Mitchell made and developed the pictures herself and many thousands of feet of film were quote, ex um, ex ugh, exquisitely tinted Sorry, this is significant because there's little to no existing evidence of any black woman earlier being in charge of the entire process of film production. 16 millimeter stock was not available. So Mitchell used uh, 35 millimeter stock, um, <clears throat> which is likely why her film cost more than $15,000 as the Savannah Tribune reported. Accounts emphasize that Mitchell's films were new because unlike other travelogue films, they quote, featured moving pictures exclusively and not stereo opticon views, unquote. In her films, uh, the Black Atlantic met the Black Mediterranean. The film brochure describes uh, this as her North African Southern European <clears throat> series, promising future series of films from future travels. Mitchell maintained ties with the Institute through her uh, summer trip, but in September 1920 officially resigned, telling the Institute monthly that she would enter the movie field as producer and presenter of high class films that disclose a phase of racial life hitherto untouched. She did not work in half measures, soften intent, or cover herself by making the film project sound experimental or temporary. At the age of 36, an age when a person knows what she's capable of, she boldly declared that she would be a film producer. The expense she invested in this enterprise, her establishment of a formal business, and the fact that she quit her job to do this filmmaking all speak against the notion that she was just an amateur. The films, which through their combination provided perhaps for the first time a view of global blackness on the American screen, likewise ex exceeded and extended the label travelogue. Presented by national personalities like uh, performer and elocutionist Henrietta Vincent Davis and business magnate uh, Madam C.J. Walker, the travelogue was a major mode of presentation, only sometimes cinematic for early Black image audiences. Mitchell was the most ambitious, Mitchell's project was the most ambitious that we know of. Um, and the most rooted in revising the image of black life that the American screen offered. It was rooted deeply in what Valerie Smith has called the documentary impulse, one that was born from caricatures that black people regularly confronted. 
though even if she were just an amateur or just a travelogue filmmaker, that doesn't mean that her film should be dismissed. As Jennifer Peterson has argued, travelogues deserve to be considered a minor cinema in the Deleuzian sense, and that they are, quote, collective political and they contain oppositional potential. Travel films allow us to document and catalog moments of domination and resistance in early cinema, unquote. Following Fatima Tobing Roney's foundational work, I seek to understand how Mitchell's project challenged the ethnographic mode of capture and provided another mode of engagement with unknown peoples. Mitchell preceded Black women filmmakers like Zora Neale Hurston and Aslanda Good Robeson, who are both trained in anthropology, but like them, her most pointed expression of the world was lexically linked to travel and anthropological discourses. She aimed to redress the anti-Blackness of both of these arenas. Indeed, her films, alongside the myriad other Black travelogues, suggest the travelogue as a key genre of articulation of Black freedom through movement. Her cinematic images of Algiers were certainly among the very first shot for Black audiences. So though we cannot know uh, what Mitchell's films looked like, because the reels have not been found, as I said earlier, Mitchell formulated montage as a political tool for Black suture and as a means for inciting diasporic experience. If, as Paul Gilroy has suggested, the ship was a key chronotope that launched Black Atlantic space-time, the ship for Elizabeth was also the breaking point that allowed a fissure in her relationship to American racism and patriarchy, a tool of psychic montage. It facilitated her engagement in diasporic temporality etched through cin cinematic time and through the technique of rapid visual movement from point to point around the globe. Before Hollywood had fully gotten its foothold, Mitchell, responding to documentary cinematic images, set out to construct a counter cinema. And her efforts to reveal, quote, a new Africa, an Africa with a civilization that in many ways is comparable to that of any country in the world, unquote, were also a ca counter anthropological form of filmmaking developed before filmmakers like Robert Flaherty or Ma Martin and Oja Johnson had founded commercial and educational uses for or had found commercial and educational uses for their anthropological filmmaking. Mitchell was conscious of her film's participation in a politics of both uplift and cinematic reinvention. Quote, these pictures, her brochure stated, are shown by way of contrast with those of savage and barbarous Africa so often depicted, unquote. Though it is difficult to know what Africa meant specifically to Mitchell, Black nationalism, arguably in its golden age during Mitchell's time, was firmly a part of the uplift saturated industrial educational discursive arena through which she moved. Likewise, I asked how Mitchell's project might have participated in the broader project of building a Black feminist geography following Catherine McKittrick. How did Mitchell's journeys and her camera eye both capture and extend space, defying national borders and insisting on an alternative geography? It's valuable to consider how Mitchell saw Africa, but also how she read Europe. Um, as McKittrick avows, quote, being materially situated in space is an inconclusive process, unquote. Mitchell's serial itinerancy, her state of constantly defying domestic confinement through travel, and her reversion to ship travel seems to suggest an alternative cartography in motion she was trying to cinematically translate. If cinema was her tool, time was her medium. Mitchell's films like Kathleen Collins and Jesse Maples first films have focused on uh, the dark-skinned male body, what Samantha Shepard calls the sporting body at the football game, soldiers fighting in real action, and magnificently physiqued North Africans. Nevertheless, she marshaled and directed these images through her vision and crucially through her voice. Reviewers agreed on Mitchell's pleasing running fire of comment and explanation on the reels, a key indicator of how the mu this musician's film sounded, but also on its particularly strong appeal to race pride, its tendency to create, to create uh, the racial consciousness that's lacking in our people. <clears throat> Quote, her entire aim and purpose is to bring to the American Black community a keen knowledge of the customs and habits and life of his brothers of color who live in foreign lands and to link them together in one chain of blood and brotherhood, unquote. Mitchell consciously opted to deliver her story as a travelogue rather than a newsreel, 
founding the film experience on her cadence and lectures and porously permitting discussion of travels not re represented on screen. <clears throat> it also allowed her the power of narration. Her voice had the power of orchestration, tying the images together. As Marianne Doan has noted, the voice in the cinema serves as a, quote, support for the spectator and his or her identification, unquote. Further, the documentary's voiceover is powerful because of how it remediates space. The voice is, quote, necessarily presented as outside of the diegetic space. Its radical otherness with respect to the diegesis endows the voice with a certain authority. It speaks without mediation to the audience and bypassing the characters, I'm sorry, bypassing the characters and establishing a complicity between itself and the spectator. Together they understand and thus place the image. Through Mitchell, though Mitchell's voice emerged from outside of the film, it was not disembodied, but rather and more subversively situated in the body of a black woman. Thus, Mitchell's voice both ruptured assumptions about racial and gendered authority and conspiratorially confided in the Black spectator about white and Black lands abroad, guiding them through the ethos of Black diasporic kinship. Mitchell's enterprise was curiously independent. Her husband, Charles E. Mitchell, who was a grandnephew um, of the image enthusiast, if we want to call him that, Frederick Douglass, was allied with men like Emma J. Scott, who could have made her project commercially viable or a part of the existing Black industrial cinematic projects that Ali Fields describes in Uplift Cinema as, quote, non-theatrical practices, hybrid forms, and non-fiction filmmaking, such as actualities and local films, unquote. But Mitchell opted for simultaneously a transnational scope, tight personal control, and an intimate educational style of presentation. She was also unaffiliated with Black women's organizations that might have aided her promotional efforts. We can see Mitchell's project as not only a significant milestone in documentary cinematic praxis, but as Afrofuturist in its reconceptualization of time and temporality and the chronotopes of transnational Blackness, revealing the speculative lineage of African American documentary. Mitchell reached into the Black pre slavery past and the racist international present to uncover its mystical future. Although she was part of an exclusive and exclusionary upper middle class culture that was unsustainable and dangerous, it is hard not to see her films as described as an act of inclusion and connection across diasporic worlds and temporalities. Mitchell worked through the medium of film to unite the African and the African American to build a delicate bridge of shadow and light across the Atlantic for the first time in American history. Her project was to make Black, Black diaspora both visual and moving. In her act of suturing Black transnational subjectivity, Elizabeth Mitchell was, is, and will be a figure of Black feminist futurity, an axiom of Black futurism. So I'll tell you a little bit about her tour, which was also pretty um, significant in that she, you know, developed these uh, locations herself. It wasn't an existing circuit. She created the circuit. So Mitchell orchestrated an impressive U.S. film tour, creating her own distribution path across Illinois, West Virginia, and Pittsburgh at teachers' conferences, high schools, and churches with Elizabeth Jones Easton, the former music instructor of the West Virginia Institute and her 1910 travel companion. So that was her first international journey. The tour embraced major cities, but in an educational vein, also smaller rural towns with Black populations that needed very much to hear and see how big and wide and open to them the Black diaspora was. Mitchell was born without a name or fortune, and she fashioned a film tour that deliberately exceeded the elite social circles we might expect from an upper class amateur travelogue maker. This tour, however, was ill-fated. Uh, Jones Easton, here on the right, um, got sick and on February 21st in 1921, unthinkably died of dysentery in Kentucky. The time of mourning left Mitchell's film tour suspended in the wake. In a time defined by movement across continents and across screens, Elizabeth Mitchell was uncharacteristically stilled. 
So just as dynamic as was her sudden and large appearance on the scene of the cinema was her retreat. After 1921, Elizabeth Mitchell's film activities quickly ceased and she retreated from visibility. She not only stopped making films, but ceased publicly discussing her films, undermining her own film legacy. Like the black femme stars turned supernovae that Philana Payton describes, and, Farrah Griff and as Farrah Griffin has noted is true of so many black women artists, Mitchell did not fit the conventional success narrative. The image I have in my mind of Elizabeth in 1921 is of her standing with the suitcase in hand at a long lonely dock waiting for a ship to come in. She is waiting so long that I think the image is still, but time is slowly moving on and dark is setting in. The ship never arrives. The news items about her in 1922 are telling. She is appointed to the board of the West Virginia State Sanitarium. And after having grandly announced her resignation from the West Virginia Institute, she perforce returns. Her first concert back at the Institute was a dirge. Mitchell's film Dream, one premised on uplift movement and the hope of Black women's empowerment that the year 1920 seemed to offer, was deferred. Her plans for an enduring Black women's cinema in the 1920s faltered. In a time especially defined by palimpsestic approaches to Black selfhood among strivers, her cinema self died in 1921, and she expanded into other endeavors. In 1931, Hoover appointed her husband, Charles C. Mitchell, to a diplomatic post as the first Black minister to Liberia, and Elizabeth would join him, and she would teach music to students in Liberia as well. Um, but I think it's important to note that in 1930, Ola Calhoun, who you're seeing here on the top right, who was collaborator in the 1920 film, would publish her first article critiquing Paul Robeson's screen image. So the spirit of filmmaking and critique that Mitchell had launched in her travelogue lived on. And what had begun as Mitchell's individual independent vision of Black cinematic exchange was carried instead as a critical concept for cinema across generations. Uh, the films were lost, but the dream of movement towards a better on-screen image carried on. So, um, so that's sort of a chunk of information about Elizabeth Mitchell that came through some of this digital humanities research. So what I'd like to do with the rest of my time today is really talk about the process of coming to um, this research and, um, and, and how that came about. So, um, you know, I want to say, first of all, like it started with a single article in the black press, you know, and then it was sort of a, a you know, history detectives kind of thing to bring together um, more about this person who was very difficult to find anything on because she really didn't have an archive anywhere, as I said earlier. Um, so I'll talk to you like I'm, I'm really not like. I don't, it's always going to hate me for saying this, but I feel I'm unqualified in some ways. I am not a, a digital humanities expert, but what I am is a, a digital humanities curious scholar um, who came in actually with some questions about digital humanities. Um, as Zoe can tell you, <laughs> um, you know, basically, um, I was afraid that it was going to require me to become sort of a coder or somehow reliant upon technology that would inevitably change. And so I was like, I don't know if I want to enter into all this. Um, but actually, what I ended up finding is that digital humanities um, was a way for me to dig deeper into my topic than I had done previously. So rather than looking at one or two cases, um, <laughs> I think I am a convert, by the way, uh, rather than looking at one or two cases, the best known or easily accessible cases, um, as it perhaps has been the tendency um, in humanities research in the cases of say, like the worst cases would be maybe like Shakespeare scholarship or Hitchcock scholarship. I was interested in knowing as much as I possibly could about my topic in increasing what sciences, scientists and social scientists call the end of the research. Um, and in taking on and taking in what we might call the bibliographic constellations of the arena, including relevant primary documents um, and also um, secondary sources that are kind of um, ancillary, right? Um, and these I thought could be a really strong support for teaching and writing. 
So I wondered at times if this made me more of a librarian than a scholar, but what I quickly realized was that this approach to grasping at the broadest possible map of the terrain I was researching made me more able to figure out what questions most needed to be answered in that terrain, and also allowed me to a better way of answering the questions most central to the field. That is, it aided me in making what we as scholars crave an important intervention in the discourse and a keen and strong argument. So I'll just say a little bit about, so yeah, the questions are how do we embrace the big picture that stands behind the smaller accounts that we offer as historians? Um, and I think then we see the craft of history as somehow curating, right, a discussion based on deep knowledge, right? Um, and I think DH does allow us to do that in some interesting ways. So I'll just say a little bit, um, I, it's it's really nice that um, I was introduced, I didn't even know if I would be, but that's great. <laughs> um, so, so I have two projects um, that I'm I'm working on and I'm, I'll, and then there's some that are on the side like Elizabeth Mitchell which um, you know I'm, I'm hoping to publish on very soon but um, but the the approach this digital humanities approach has really guided the research I've done on the black women film critics project um, and um, and I think that it's really interesting that Elizabeth Mitchell came about as a result of the research I was doing in uh, the Black Women Film Critics Project that, you know, I was kind of sorting through a lot of these sources and, and an article about her emerged and I thought, wow, this is a fascinating story. Um, so, but I'm also happy to talk more about the Black Women Film Critics Project um, in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> So I think in historical writing and maybe in humanities research more broadly, projects tend to fail when we have too few sources or when the sources team seem too many to control or comment upon. And um, in many ways, these two projects are polar opposites in terms of their research profiles. I was able to find an enormous number of surprising locations where Black women's film criticism was published. Um, I was able to find so little about Elizabeth Mitchell, I was getting worried, right? You know, you could find a few articles here and there. Um, but I think DH really helps, um, or digital methods and methodologies, which I'll talk a little bit more about, really interestingly helped in both projects. Um, in the Black Women Film Critics Project, really um, with finding new sources and also organizing the discussion and, and um, and and the material and then also with elizabeth mitchell um, really finding surprising spaces where there could be more about her um, so i want to talk about the trope of digital extension which is kind of how i thought about dh before i started getting involved in this research i think many current scholarly projects see digital humanities as, as a way to preserve or present some aspect of a larger project many presses now welcome and even invite digital extensions of scholarly book projects that operate as proofs of concept illustrations or vibrant or interactive explanatory apparatuses for um, the book so for me i think the promise of digital humanity, humanities is, you know, also expressed in that way. But I've come to believe that the digital um, work can actually be done much earlier and in the methodological or core of the project. So, um, oh, sorry, I'm slow <laughs> with my slides here. Um, so a question we might ask is how can digital humanities innovation, oh no, sorry, it disappeared. Um, <laughs> Oh, a positively affect the ways that we initially approach our research and then the methods we employ. And that was so fast. I can't believe I read that. Um, so uh, let's just talk a little bit about the lineages I see for Black digital humanities. Um, so um, the possibilities, I just want to say, for studying the Black press in the United States have expanded exponentially in the past 10 to 15 years. I had witnessed the development of my senior colleagues' work, like Anna Everett and Charlene Register, who had studied the Black press and their important books on uh, Hollywood but had done their research through the painstaking interface with um, something that I've come to both have a vague fondness for and also to <laughs> have a lot of contempt for, <laughs> which is microfilm, right? Um, and that's been, that was the main way that they were um, interacting with these black press sources. 
And there are still important resources that hold uh, the concept of maybe a bibliographic constellation of research um, and prefigure digital humanities, um, such as the Schomburg uh, clipping file, which was created in 1924 by Black librarian Catherine Allen Latimer, who was the first Black librarian hired by the New York Public Library. Um, and she's sitting here at the desk. You can kind of see her with the file cabinets next to her. Um, there's also the very large Tuskegee clipping file, which contained 188 file cabinets worth of material and was compiled by Jesse P. Guzman um, and Ralph N. Davis, and the Hampton clipping files, which uh, contain 5,500 clippings um, from nearly 100 Black newspapers in the early 20th century. And it's kind of interesting that those were created from 500 scrapbooks from 1880s, collected from 1880s to the 1920s. <clears throat> So it's worth noting how important Black women bibliographers were to establishing this way of looking at Black American life um, that is a precursor to our digital modes and modalities. Um, however, the rise of uh, ProQuest Black newspapers, um, I think I do have this on a slide here, and it's going to be fast again. <laughs> um, so uh, the rise of ProQuest Black Newspapers, the Library of Congress's Chronicling America, Redex and Newsbank's Black Press Source List, as well as uh, the many important Black press holdings in JSTOR and the Internet Archive has been crucial to broadening not only access to Black press resources, but the searchability has made it possible to parse more carefully what various Black press sources were saying at different points in history. In other words, it has challenged the monolith of the Black press and allowed us to examine each as an institution um, and the individual voices and the power relationships that come under the umbrella of the Black press at each newspaper. It has also brought to light voices in the Black press that have heretofore been marginalized or kept out of the, the limelight because they weren't the Chicago Defender. They didn't have the largest circulation. Um, but as we know, circulation in the Black press is actually something quite difficult to determine because there's a factor of people passing the paper around or reading to one another. So circulation wasn't always, um, you know, just how many uh, copies were purchased when it came to the Black press. Uh, the, the searchability of the Black press on a larger scale than has previously been possible has made a glacial shift in the possibilities of Black press research. And this availability has been fueled by important activist scholars like Kim Gallen, who you'll hear from later this week. Um, it's also really important that we know about folks like James P. Denke, whose important volume, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit again, um, really has provided a crucial index of the large number of Black press resources so that we no longer think it's like eight or nine newspapers, right? But we're, we're thinking on a much larger scale. So I'll say a little bit about my own experience with um, the relative value of commercial and non-commercial uh, sources. Um, so commercial sources have the value of running on a stable platform, but if you're seeking to look across databases, it's necessary to learn and relearn the quirks of each database's interface and search capabilities. In addition, it's worth noting that given the large amount uh, of money that ProQuest, for example, charges, there's very little ancillary support or knowledge to help researchers. So even when I have sought to contact ProQuest to let them know about problems with OCRing or instances where authors are not cited properly, um, they don't have a, a way really to process that information or even a wiki where users can share information and assist one another with searching. So I remember when I was a postdoc at University of Pennsylvania hearing the large sum of money that ProQuest was charging for access to digitized black newspapers. And the first thought I had was whether HBCs would be able to purchase um, access. And so I think this raises a question about the ethics of digitization and access um, and what responsibilities um, various companies have to being both making their um, resources accessible to those who really can use the resources and also um, 
how they operate as stewards of the information in the way that some of those earlier bibliographers on my slides um, were operating as stewards of the information and providing that kind of help and, and um, context for some of the work that's um, in the papers. So meanwhile, Internet Archive and other interfaces like the LOC Chronicling America um, are slightly more unwieldy in terms of searching from time to time, but they can be manipulated to bring forward better results and to get batch results and that sort of thing. Um, and they also cover a broader range of Black perspectives and voices than um, those main uh, sources covered in ProQuest. So, um, I want to say a few words about the literal and metaphorical trope of searching <laughs> as it appears in our work. So our work involves in its broadest sense searching for voices marginalized in mainstream discourses to bring them to light, but also searching for new information and new angles and approaches that challenge existing paradigms. Our work also involves the literal action of putting search terms into search engines from Google to ProQuest to NewsBank to find new pieces to the puzzle. So when I was a graduate student, I learned early that the terms I used to describe my work would not be the same as the search terms I would use to produce new hits um, or, or you know, to find new articles. But this point has been underscored and I now realize how important it is to approach research from multiple angles, thinking across power relations and with knowledge of interlocking oppressions. What terms would have been used at a certain time and by whom? what misspellings or alternate spellings might have occurred. Much like a jigsaw puzzle, original research means one has to turn the piece to see where it fits. What is needed in this endeavor is a deep and wide curiosity about facts, some of which are going to be directly written about in your work and some of which will not, and a sense of the history and the context around the topics we're exploring, and also the nuance involved in what we in film studies and our friends in English departments called textual analysis back in the day, that is the close reading of texts. Those skills can help us as we sort and sift the available documents to find those that give texture and meaning to the live stories and voices we are bringing to the forefront. So I want to pause for a moment of poetry because I think that's always good. Um, and to look at one of my favorite poets, Lucille Clifton. Um, so what she says in her poem, why some people be mad at me sometimes is they ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories and I keep on remembering mine. And I think this is an important um, guide and, and light for me, maybe a part of the magic lantern, if we'll go back to that metaphor, um, in my own historiography. Um, so I'll say a few more words about searching, because it's like what I spend <laughs> so much of my time doing. Um, and so I call this little piece like searching for her or the painful logistics of machine assisted archival time travel. So I search sometimes like a child searching for a lost toy, <clears throat> sometimes like a child searching for a lost mother, sometimes with the insistence of a mother looking for a lost child. In logistical senses, I'm searching the film, the terms film or moving picture in search engines. In mystical terms, I'm searching for her. These are the ways that I look for black women's media cultures against the tide of cis white male history and historiography. Where will she be found? Where will she register? Will it be somewhere across the waves of black press coverage, a note, a lost suitcase, a found camera, a film talk, a reel? Will she be found in a will on a ship's manifest? Dangling headlines fat with hubris loom large over these figures doing violence. I can barely see the small typeface that mentions them. Sometimes she has been fashioned to a into a foundation for some white man's work, invisible as anything but material and fabric, a worker or widget, faceless and nameless, but known to exist. Sometimes she is described or visualized in a white frame as a tight-faced mammy whose mask is thick, but who quietly demands to be called Mrs. These women register as names, as dates, sometimes blessedly as faces, but not as voices when it is voices I most wish to hear. I sit, fingers poised over keys, wishing that they could tell me something. The news, a hay across the gaping historical divide. Just when I find a name, it seems the path ends. She is gone. To marriage, to self-authored renaming, or to something more on ominous, <clears throat> and she's gone from the record. 
Usually something domestic has caught her and I have to go wider. What can be known about them is not always what I want to know. Another date, another location, another connection, but all signs will help building a case for existence that needs to be as airtight, as interesting as a criminal case, wedging itself against the forces of forgetting that would enfold her. It's hard to describe the pervasive forced invisibility that obscures Black women's media cultures. And here I'll just, I have, these are a bunch of the names I've searched over time. You know, so these are, these were her names then. Which name cast into the sea of records will give more of her? Show the shape of the arc of her narrative, her touch and bend on the history of stuttered frames of light and dark. So um, I'll just say a few more words here. So um, over the course of this project um, on black women film critics, I've really um, expanded the number of sources that I've been using. Um, from around six, <laughs> not to 6,000, I'm literally not, I do not have 6,000 in the project, but I'm aware that there are more than 6,000 Black press sources. So I feel um, some um, desire to be representative in one way or another in terms of the, um, the broader scope of what those sources represent in terms of Black um, history and Black self-articulation. Um, so 10 years ago, if I had stumbled on an article about Elizabeth Mitchell and was dazzled by it, I would have been largely unable to find more, or I might not have stumbled on her at all. Um, so ProQuest Black Newspaper is perhaps the dominant interface of, uh, for the Black press about 10 years ago or 10 to 15 years ago, and which contains the national editions of large number of Black newspapers. Not only does not have many articles about Elizabeth Mitchell, but um, there were many fewer papers then in ProQuest. Um, and the Library of Congress uh, Chronicling America project was not where it is now. And as the battle um, whether over whether or how much and in what way to give access to Google newspapers waged um, back then, um, her story would stay largely buried beneath the tumult. And my understanding is that now you can browse Google newspapers, but you cannot search Google newspapers, at least the historical versions of those newspapers, even though they contain really important publications. Um, so, but thanks to digital activists, as I said earlier, like Kim Gallen and the, prolifer the proliferation of digital access, as well as digital methods and tools for finding histories buried has fundamentally changed not only how we can visualize data from the past, but also what we can know about the past. Um, and I think it does a few important things. Um, it shifts um, the kinds of uh, questions we can answer and ask, the methods of retrieval we can pursue, and uh, what we, and uh, by this, I mean the broader we can know about the past. Um, and so I think it really also shifts um, how we can make interventions in terms of history, American history, Black history, and film history, which are really important discourses for me. So um, the question I kind of um, want us to linger on is how can digital humanities be employed as a means for building an argument and an intervention into how we see the past, as well as providing a gateway to accessing it or visualizing it? Um, okay. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, I stumbled across the life um, work of Elizabeth Mitchell while I was trying to discover another history I had been taught didn't exist. And this was the history of Black women's film criticism. And so the fact that's often put out there is the first Black woman made a feature film in the year. And I, it was said in my introduction, so, um, but you can sort of ask yourself, and it's, they say 1980, right? <clears throat> so we're often told this fact, but it has been often used to reify a narrative of marginality that's not correct. A history compacted under other quote unquote larger histories or master narratives is a history nonetheless, no matter how much those master narratives have been normalized and their dominating centrality to the point that we do not question them. Mitchell emerged from a small line, a query cast into a large C. I was searching, sorry, um, ah, um, I was searching film terms in the 107 Black newspapers digitized in the Library of Congress and was trying to discover new critics that were working outside of the Black newspaper records. Um, 
So the, the project is designed to challenge the myth of uh, Black women's creative engagement with the, that, I'm sorry, that Black women's creative engagement with the cinema began when the first Black American woman made a feature film in 1980. And I think that that myth has been driven by um, Hollywood's fetishization of the feature um, and the willful ignoring of Black women's filmmaking on television and incredibly power and in incredibly powerful short films, many of which um, in their conceptual depth and meaning dwarf Hollywood films, as well as the difficulty of ascertaining what constitutes a feature film in the silent era or outside of a commercial context. So all of that has left many with the idea that Black women's film culture sort of begins in 1980. However, the longstanding engagement of Black women critics with films in and outside of Hollywood is the grounds for a crucial counter history of the 80 years of Black women's film cultures before uh, Black women made so-called feature films. So deep has been the normalizing of the idea that Black women or Black people lack media history that many Black people believe it ourselves. So when I told my aunt, who is a Delta Sigma Theta, for example, that I was writing a book on Black women film critics, she said I could not do that because there weren't any. <laughs> and meanwhile, Delta Sigma Theta was the only sorority or Black women's organization to be so concerned about the cinematic image, both in 1942 when they protested stormy weather, and also in 1976 when they actually financed and produced their own film, Countdown at Cassini. So it's an actually pretty significant history um, of Black women's intervention into cinema that needs to be told. Um, so the last sort of thought I'll leave us with is that Elizabeth, Elizabeth Mitchell's narrative emerged out of the Black press, which I've mentioned before, but I think it's important, I want to sort of weave that in a little bit more. Um, so I've already done that. Okay. Um, the, I think it's important to think that, um, you know, the Black press is often considered sort of an impoverished source in some way, often by historians, uh, mainline mainstream historians. You know, we can't trust the Black press um, and, or, you know, there are questions raised about the source. But I want to consider that we need to approach all historical sources carefully and in a way that seeks um, multiple avenues of verification, a kind of iterability. Um, and I think that when we do that in the Black press, we can see that there is iterability. People are talking about some of the same things in different locations. Um, but I see the Black press as an important archive of Black history. Um, it's long stood against the notion that Black subjects lack a history. As an institution, it's been essentially historical, operating on a mundane daily basis, as Matthew Delmont's Black Quotidian has revealed, to show forth the events that make up um, Black existence, survival, and often triumph. But we might see the Black presses also operating with a kind of substitutionary logic, where cinema triumphs were rare and hard to achieve, the press could become, in a way, an alternative cinema, a place for revisioning and revising what the screen had to offer and for crafting and uplifting an alternative optical framework, a site of intermedial slippage and recovery. It's important and worth noting that it was T. Thomas Fortune, known as the Dean of the Black Press and an important early architect of Black civil rights, who was Mitchell's press agent and who made me take notice of her accomplishments at first. It was his grand narration of her that gave me uh, a very first image of her. Um, and he certainly recognized the significance um, of Mitchell as an early and deeply dedicated Black woman filmmaker. So, um, so I will stop there and open it up um, for questions um, at this point. And thank you so much for having me. So I'll stop the share, right? Let's see if I can do that quickly. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Um, sure. I'm now going to invite our moderator, UC Irvine PhD candidate in visual studies, Sam Carter, uh, to moderate our Q&A session. Feel free to add any questions and comments for our keynote speaker to the Q&A function now. And Sam, whenever you're ready. Great, thank you so much, Tatiana. And thank you so much, Dr. Scott, for your wonderful presentation. Um, as Tatiana mentioned, please feel free to add questions to the Q&A. To give our audience a little bit of time to do that, I will start if you don't mind, Dr. Scott. Sure. Great, excellent, thank you so much. 
I was really curious about, you mentioned like finding ways to approach your research from multiple angles. And I was wondering if you could speak to any strategies that you have for doing that. I was trying to think that through. I feel like it's the thing I think about the least, but it comes back to me. <laughs> like I'll be like doing something mundane, and like getting something out of the refrigerator. I'll be, oh, what if I try this? You know, and and one of a lot of it is like different names and different sources. Like, have I tried all the names and sort of being systematic about like where I've tried what and what results come of that? Um, but you know, one thing I started doing recently with the Black Women Film Critics Project is to start to search titles of films that might have been a particular interest to Black women, rather than searching movie terms like film or um, motion picture or flicker or moving picture. Um, but to actually, so Countdown at Cusini was actually one of the films that I started searching. And it was really interesting. I hit on a critic I had never heard of before. And she was actually, um, I started with just the Black ProQuest newspapers. And then I broadened the search out to all of the ProQuest resources um, was another, you know, maybe example of this. Um, and then I, I struck on this person named Ellen Holly, who was an actress and a film critic who was writing in the New York Times, but she was like, she had these like periodic columns over time in the New York Times. Um, and I thought, oh, wow, this is someone I probably wouldn't have discovered if I was keeping it narrow. Um, but it's, I think it's sort of those decided moments to sort of widen out and look at something broader that, um, that can sometimes provide like a way through. Um, and I, I actually really encourage like getting not only nerdy, <laughs> but getting kind of funky with the process and like, okay, well, let's just try something like, like change the spelling of this person's name or, you know, do things that you would never do in your written scholarship, but that, um, you know, certainly did happen through the process of, you know, uh, misprints in the press, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, I think that, um, that it's actually been been fun to have those moments where you start sort of like, oh, this might be another way in that I never thought of um, to the research. Great, that's really fun. And I really appreciate what you share about um, approaches to search. I'm going to ask one more question and um, I, I think we have one here. So after this project, do you consider yourself a digital humanist? Ah, who asked it? <laughs> if it's Zoe, she, yes, absolutely. Because yeah, um, she converted me all the way. Um, but, but no, um, I don't think I can go back from this. I mean, there's a certain like, Again, it's it's being able to see the project from various vantage points, um, and you know whatever center point you've decided on, you know then looking at it from a three hundred and sixty view, it's hard to um, imagine not doing that um, for future projects. I think it be, kind of maybe gets into the way that you work and the way that you, you know, your horizons are shifted. At least in my case. Um, so I, I think so, but I don't know if I do it right all the time, you know, in terms of what, um, the, the, um, discourse itself, um, prizes, you know what I mean? So I'm definitely still learning, uh, but I, I think that, um, I'm compelled and drawn into, um, both the methods and, and the discourse um, in a certain way that it would be hard to go back from. Yeah. I hear you. Thank you so much for your response. Um, another question, have you included any of this research in your undergraduate instruction? Are students interested in the detective work? or the goal of reclaiming lost voices and tech tools? Um, I haven't 
had, so we mainly teach graduate students in the program I'm in. And so I haven't had the opportunity, um, but having taught for many years at CUNY, um, solely, pretty much solely undergraduate students, I can, I can very much imagine that being something undergraduate students would get excited about um, for sure. Um, I mean, what we were doing back at CUNY was I taught a course called The Peopling of New York through film and, and media and, and uh, images and people and the students would build their own websites um, where they would do some mapping and, and you know, geography, um, but also look at the history of images of various sites in New York. And um, I was always really amazed by how um, open students were. And this is, you know, in the early <laughs> to the early to late 2000s into the um you know uh, you know early parts of of uh, like I think 2010 to 2015 and and so like we didn't have accessible what we have now you know and i still felt that students were getting very very interested and involved with it um so I haven't had a chance to test it, but I definitely would love the opportunity to do so. I think there is an excitement about it. And I do to teach a graduate course in Black women media makers of the diaspora. And in that class, we've created a website um, with pages for individual filmmakers. Um, and students have been really passionate about finding filmmakers and talking about them in ways they haven't been discussed and creating kind of an outward facing discourse on them. Um, so, so yeah, that's, there is a, there is a way to definitely work this into um, your teaching practice. Absolutely. I love, I love that incorporation of digital humanities in your pedagogy. And uh, I know I, I personally teach uh, intro to film and history of film at Irvine Valley College. And as I was listening to your presentation, I thought I certainly would love to bring more of this into uh, my own syllabus. So thank you so much. Um, and I think we have more question time and more questions. So I will proceed with those. Uh, who was the Black woman you mentioned who wrote for the New York Times? What years and what subjects? Okay, yeah, I'm not fully done researching her. <laughs> and don't scoop me, please, Susan Anderson. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, um, it was Ellen Holly. Um, and she, I know she did some, um, her acting was on a soap opera, I believe. And she had some other <clears throat> acting roles, but she also really had this question about like, where do we go with black women's images in media? You know, what are, what are, and I think it was born of like avenues closed, right? You know, or avenues narrowed, et cetera. Um, and so I think um, it was in the seventies that she was writing. Um, and I mean, the 70s is actually a fascinating moment in terms of Black film criticism because of Black exploitation. Like there are critics born as soon as that movement takes off, right? And I feel like I no longer want to teach you know, Black exploitation film, so called, um, without teaching the critics and the criticism because those discourses belong in conversation. Um, both the, the people saying, you know, I mean, not to make a binary out of it, but there are people saying, yes, yes, we need to see a lot of this. And there are people saying, no, no, no. And I think all of that provides a really rich perspective um, <clears throat> on, you know, how people understand the screen, how they understand its relationship to their own subjectivities, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, so that's what I know about um, Ellen Holly, and and her subject really was generally like Black women's images in um, on the screen. So. Excellent. I want to make sure to ask. I see a few questions about the specific digital humanities tools that were employed for your project and presentation. So could you speak to that? Um, yeah, so I, I used um, a lot of the, 
I mean, I consider kind of the the resources I use, the the newspaper access as a part of the infrastructure of digital humanities. Um, so that I think is a is what I would kind of center on. Um, but I also did try to get a little, you know, <laughs> I guess funky, maybe that's the right word, with with some of the visualizations around her trips and I don't you saw that I was using like Google Earth I guess I was supposed to actually credit that I think it comes up but anyway Google Earth um, Studio was one of the the tools that I used to look at her 1920 journey um, <clears throat> I also used ArcGIS to map out the trips that she took at different moments in time which that you saw in the presentation um, and, um, you know, I've also been using database software like Zotero to begin to organize um, a lot of the, I guess it's now like, an, I think I have 500 or so um, documents about Elizabeth Mitchell um, that I've gathered from different sources. And so that's been, I don't want to underestimate the value of organization and just being able to say, okay, wait, what year was this? And go back in and find it through a couple quick search um, searches in Zotero, right, um, into, into the existing like archive I may have created. Um, and so, so yeah, I think that there's um, real value in that. Um, so I, I don't like, I get nervous because like, I don't know if that's what you mean, but I'm happy to have a follow-up question. If, if there are tools also that you think, um, might be interesting to user, um, apply to this research, I'd be really happy to hear about that as well. Thank you. Did Elizabeth Easton, Mitchell's companion who died, appear often in your research? Did she leave an archive? I'm so glad people care about, no one has ever cared about Elizabeth Easton up to this point. She is interesting. And she's like another one where it's like, how do we find this? And this like Zoe and I were both working, like how do we find Elizabeth Easton? And I think maybe she is, well, she's at least as interesting in terms of the research path because it became so like fruitless at a certain level to even use the black press that we began to use things like um, ancestry.com and find a grave. So that's how I actually discovered her death happened in 1921 and from dysentery was from find a grave where they have an actual image of her death certificate which includes cause of death and um and so um so yeah um she's interesting too because both um easton and mitchell were um graduates of music conservatories. They're both you know, trained musicians. So Mitchell graduated from the New England Conservatory of Music and Easton from the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music, which I think has a different name now and I may be butchering the name anyway. Um, so I did try to seek out records for both of them at those institutions. And I was able to find Mitchell's um, you know, thank, there was actually just like cards on like her course of study that I was able to get scans of. Um, in terms of Easton, um, they weren't able to find her records, but she's a little bit more interesting, perhaps because not interesting, but um, that institution really wasn't admitting um, Black people at all. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, I think that she may have passed for her time at the um, at the institution. And so I, I'm not sure if the institution wanted to like talk about that history. <laughs> um, and so I, I just, I don't know, but I wasn't able to find anything more about um, Easton's musical career. Um, whereas Mitchell, like I was able to find her, um, her yearbook, her yearbook photos and like what her classmates were saying about her in the yearbook and all of that. So you, it does give a window into her time as a musician. So. Um, I think we're uh, a little bit past time now and I really wanna thank um, Sam for moderating the Q&A discussion. And I also really wanna thank you, Dr. Scott, um, for your um, amazing, amazing talk. Um, I also want to thank the rest of the Cali DHRI team and all of our attendees for your time and attention today. I'd like to invite everyone who hasn't to register for day two and day three keynote speakers. 
um, Angela LeBlanc Ernest and Dr. Kim Gallen, um, if you haven't already, using the link in the chat. I also want to invite you to register for the upcoming virtual panel next week um, for Art, uh, Art Power Community, a Black Panther Party 55th Anniversary Retrospective uh, exhibition hosted by UC Irvine Libraries. Um, feel free to register um, for our virtual opening panel. Um, and the link for that is in the chat as well. Um, thank you all for your um, time and attention today. Um, be well, everyone. Thank you.